Today's lecture is going to be on the histology of the digestive system. Uh, the first part is we're going to discuss is going to be the esophagus. With the esophagus, uh, we know that the esophagus contains both the skeletal muscle and the smooth muscle. So closer to the oropharynx, uh, higher up, it would be considered to be more skeletal muscle. And as we enter into the cardia around this region, uh, the esophagus changes into smooth muscle. The function of the stomach is it continues uh, both chemical and mechanical digestion of the bolus. So as the food is entering from the esophagus into the stomach, we consider it to be the bolus. After the stomach utilizes secretion and muscular action, and as it enters into the duodenum or the small intestine, then it's referred to as chyme. So the first structure we'll be talking about will be the cardia. Uh, it is the superior entrance where we see it entering from the esophagus into the stomach. In this region, we're going to see cells later on that uh, produce a lot of protective alkaline secretions. The fundus, which is the superior surface, uh, and also in contact with the diaphragm. Uh, the cells in this region of the fundus, the cells in the region of the fundus are going to produce uh, highly acidic secretions. And then we have the body. And the body is the largest regions of the stomach. It also produces highly acidic secretions. And then down here we have the pylorus. Um, it also produces more protective alkaline secretions. So that's important that the food is then has more of an alkaline structure as it enters into the duodenum. Uh, the pylorus has two uh, structures. It has the pyloric antrum and then the pyloric canal, which also houses the pyloric sphincter. And this pyloric sphincter here is a ring of smooth vessel. It helps regulate the entrance of the chyme into the small intestine. And it also closes with sympathetic activity. Uh, so sympathetic activity such as exercise. The gastric folds here. Uh, we see gastric folds here. Uh, these gastric folds are only seen when the stomach is empty. So when the stomach is full, uh, we see that it allows for the stomach to stretch or to distend. And then we have three layers of muscularis or muscular layers, and they're all named according to their striations of muscles. So here we can see the striations of the muscle. Uh, the smooth muscle is the longitudinal layer, and then we see the striations for the circular layer, and then we see uh, how they run in an oblique fashion for the oblique layer. So when we're looking at the overall function or the cellular function of each one of these, what we're going to be first concentrating on is going to be just uh, the simple breakdown. So the first thing that we see is that we see a layer of simple columnar epithelial. And then as we get lower into um, the mucosa layer, we're going to have specialized cells that are going to line these gastric pits. So each one of these cells are going to release secretion into the gastric uh, pits, which will then uh, be processed on the stomach lumen. We can also see that the submucosa has a high amounts of arteries and veins, uh, which we'll talk about here in a second. And then the muscularis, as mentioned earlier, we have the three layers. So inside, we're looking at the simple columnar epithelial cells, which are on the uh, surface here. And then we have the gastric pits. And then we have the different types of gastric glands, which are representative uh, over here to the right. So the first one is the sur surface muc muc mucus cell. Uh, it continually secretes mucins. So that's important because it prevents the lumen or the outer inner surface of the stomach lining from any ulcerations. And it also helps protect the simple columnar epithelial tissue that's located uh, right here. 
And then we have the mucous neck cells. The mucous neck cells, they produce acidic mucins. Uh, they help maintain, they help maintain uh, acidic conditions in the stomach, uh, which is essential for breakdown of food. And then we have the parietal cells. They do two things. Uh, first thing is their structure. They have a caniculi or an opening here. So you can kind of see this pathway. I'll just draw a circle around it. But this caniculi, there's one located here too. Uh, these caniculi are lined with microvilli. And that's important uh, because the most important aspect is that they're going to produce hydrochloric acid. Um, these secretions of hydrochloric acid helps denature proteins uh, and to accelerate chemical digestion. They also produce an intrinsic factor. So once the intrinsic factor is produced, it pushes out into the caniculi, the microvilli push it out into the gastric pit, and then eventually into the surface. The intrinsic factor is important because it helps uh, B12 absorption in the ileum of the small intestine. Uh, the next one is the chief cells. It does two things. It se secretes a pepsinogen, and the pepsinogen at first is inactive. So as it's being released into the gastric pit, the pepsinogen is inactive, and then it's converted... Um, once it hits the stomach, the acid content of the stomach then converts it uh, to pepsin. Basically, pepsin is going to help break down uh, proteins into smaller fragments. And then gast gastric lipase uh, helps break down fats. And the last one we see is an enteroendocrine cell. Uh, it secretes a hormone called gastrin. Again, once it secretes the hormone gastrin, it's going to stimulate uh, the chief cells and the parietal cells uh, to secrete also. Um, it also increases the contractile activity of the gastric muscles, so the three muscles in the uh, muscularis layer. Uh, once the, the bolus of food is in the stomach, usually a liter of food uh, entering into the stomach, or you can think of it as, uh, you know, like one burger entering in and then consumed will enter the small intestine uh, based off of all the secretions. Uh, it'll increase to three to four liters, or you can think of it as three to four burger sizes by the time it leaves. So the next part we're going to look at is going to be the small intestine. With the small intestine, what we see is that there's going to be some accessory organs such as the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, which are going to play a role in uh, digestion. The total length of the small intestine, uh, when we look at the duodenum or the jejunum and the ileum, it's about 20 foot in length. Um, it extends from the pylorus sphincter of the stomach uh, to the ileocecal valve of the large intestine. So the first one we'll talk about is the duodenum. It contains uh, a duodenal papilla. Uh, so up in here we're going to see where the gallbladder and, uh, is going to produce bile secretions from the liver and the gallbladder. And then it's also going to have from a minor duodenal papilla or an opening from pancreatic secretions. And then we have the jejunum. It's the primary region for chemical digestion and nutrient absorption. So this whole region here is going to be where we see the majority of digestion and secretion or digestion and nutrient absorption. And then the ileum, as I mentioned earlier, is going to terminate at the ileocecal valve. So when we're looking at the histology, uh, the first part of the small intestine that we should look at are going to be these circular folds. It's very similar to the gastric folds. 
Their job is to increase uh, surface area for nutrient absorption. And it also, these folds help slow down the movement of the chyme that was uh, coming from the stomach. Uh, we can see that the muscularis layer, it has the inner and the outer longitudinal layers. It's just missing the oblique that we saw in the stomach. When we look at the mucosa layer in particular, we're going to see these intestinal villi. Uh, these villi and microvilli again increase the surface area for absorption and secretion. And if we look over here in the mucosa layer, we'll see how the arterial system, the lymphatic system, and the venous system, and including the capillary beds, are all going to uh, be contained in each one of these villi. So every single villi has an artery, um, a capillary, a vein, and um, the lymphatic vessel. So when we're looking at it, the majority where we see the connection between the arteries and the veins, the majority of absorption is going to occur, I'll just put a little dot, at the connection between the arteries and the veins or the capillaries. The lymphatic structure will see a, a, a series of lacteals. These are important that they absorb all the lipids and lipid solid, soluble vitamins. So similar to the stomach, we have a, a cells that are important. We just spoke about the microvilli. Um, and then we'll come down here. We also have the goblet cells that are going to produce mucins. Uh, so it helps just lubricate the lining of the small intestine. And the first one we'll talk about is going to be uh, the unicellular gland. Um, it synthesizes uh, enteropeptidase, uh, which activates the alpha and beta cells secretions that was released from the pancreas. So this enzyme actually promotes uh, the alpha and beta cells to release glucagon and insulin from the pancreas. And then the next one we have is an enteroendocrine cell. Their job is to release a hormone and specifically what the hormone does is there's a secretin hormone that stimulates uh, the pancreatic ducts to release an alkaline fluid. Uh, there's also a cholecystokinin, which activates the acenar cells in the pancreas to produce mucins and digestive enzymes. And it also produces a gastric inhibitory peptide, which slows down at the digestive activity. So this one has a lot of effect on some of the accessory digestive organs. So once we go into the large, uh, large intestine, uh, the job of the large intestine, once the chyme enters in from the ileocecal valve, is the main job is for absorption of the, of the water from the chyme. Uh, to solidify it eventually and, and turn it into what we call feces. Uh, there is some absorption as the chyme travels through. A small per percentage of nutrients uh, that may be remaining in the chyme can be absorbed at this point, but its main function is to absorb most of the water. There's a structure down here as the chyme enters in the vermiform appendix. It houses a series of lymphocytes filled with lymphatic nodules, which can stimulate any type of immune response if necessary. So there's three types of movements or contractions that is going to occur as we go through uh, the large intestine. Uh, there's a peristaltic movement, which is very slow, uh, sluggish, and weak. And then there's a hostile churning. Uh, the hostral churning usually occurs um, at the hostrum before the right colic flexor. And it, it basically is stimulated uh, when the hostrum fills until distension uh, 
of the hostrum will uh, stimulate a reflex contract contraction of the muscularis. So basically when we see the food entering in and we see the distension, then we'll see hostiles churning, which will push it through the right colic flexor uh, through the transverse mesocolon. Uh, this is going to continue until we hit into the teni coli. And the teni coli is where we see the third type of movement, which is called a mass movement. They're very powerful peristaltic contractions involving uh, at the region of the tenia coli. And it basically is going to propel uh, the, the, um, the chyme uh, into uh, the rectum. Usually this contraction is going to occur anywhere between two uh, to three times a day. So when we're looking at this whole process, uh, we're essentially taking out the water. And then by the time it's reaching uh, around the, uh, the, the last part of the large intestine, then we're getting into the rectum. And then we should, at this point, have uh, the majority of the water uh, pulled out. So at the rectum, uh, there's, it's considered to be a muscular tube. It readily expands to store accumulated fecal material uh, prior to defecation or elimination. There are three thick transverse folds of the rectum called the rectal valves, which are here. So there's three of them. And it ensures is, um, that the fecal material is retained uh, during uh, the passage of gas. Uh, the rectum is going to terminate at the anal canal, and the anal canal has important aspects. Uh, it has these anal columns, so the columns would be the ridges, but more importantly, it has uh, anal sinuses. And the anal sinuses have cells that secrete mucin for lubrication during uh, defecation. The internal and external anal sphincters uh, they are open and close the anal canal during defecation. Uh, so, and is usually triggered by a stretch receptor. So an excess, the first accessory organ that we'll speak about is going to be the liver. Um, the main function is going to be it, that it produces and releases bile that's collected in the gallbladder. Um, it also detoxifies blood the blood, such as um, detoxifying the blood from drugs, any type of metabolites or poisons, and it'll actually store them in the liver. It also stores excessive nutrients absorbed by the GI tract and can release them uh, when necessary, such as uh, an overaccumulation of certain vitamins, and if the body is uh, deficient in the vitamins, then the, the liver can release them into circulation. And the liver also produces uh, different types of plasma proteins like albumins and globulins. So as we can see in the picture, the right lobe is much larger than the left lobe. Uh, they're divided by a falciform ligament. And then on the very inferior edge, we see a round ligament, which is the remnants of a, of a fetal umbilical vein. On the posterior surface, they have important structures. We have the hepatic artery proper, uh, the hepatic duct, and the hepatic portal vein. And then we also have the gallbladder, as mentioned earlier, coming in. Uh, they are divided uh, when we look at the different lobes, there is subdivisions of the right lobe. It's the caudate lobe and the quadrate lobe. So there are essentially four lobes, uh, the right and the left lobe, and then we have two subdivisions in the right lobe, the quadrate and the caudate. So when we look at the general circulation, of the of the liver, uh, what we're looking at here is going to be um, the hepatic 
um, the veins coming from the small and the large intestine, the veins coming from the spleen. Uh, so, and also the blood coming from the heart. So the hepatic portal vein is, is roughly the biggest aspect or the biggest um, contributor into the liver. So the hepatic portal vein is going to bring about 75% of the total blood volume uh, into the liver, particularly into these hepatic lobules. So when we look at the right and left hepatic portal veins coming into these different lobules, uh, they're containing nutrient-rich blood uh, with very little oxygen. The oxygenated blood is going to be coming from the hepatic artery from the heart. So the hepatic portal vein that's entering into the lob lobules again is carrying, uh, carrying blood from the capillary beds of the small intestine, the capillary beds of the spleen, and the capillary beds of the pancreas also. Um, these will eventually mix with the oxygen and rich blood inside of the hepatic lobule, uh, particularly in the hepatic sinusoid, sinusoid um, of the hepatic lobule. Uh, so the liver is basically going to be bringing nutrient-rich deoxygenated blood and oxygen-rich blood into the hepatic lobule uh, for mixing. So on a histology slide, the first part we should look at are going to be uh, the portal triad. So this part right here is what I just mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, the only addition is going to be the bile ductile. Uh, so this is coming from uh, <clears throat> the bile ductile. And then we have the hepatic artery, which is bringing oxygen-rich blood. Uh, into a sinusoid, and a sinusoid is just basically this canal that's eventually going to uh, lead into the central vein, and then the central vein is going to then lead into the inferior vena cava. So we have the oxygen, oxygenated blood coming from the aorta, from the heart, uh, which is called the hepatic artery. And then we have this hepatic portal vein, which is coming from the small intestine, spleen, and pancreas. And they are also going to enter into the sinusoid, and it's going to mix inside of the sinusoid. So once the blood is being mixed inside of the sinusoid, uh, we have a protective mechanism called a reticuloendothelial cell. And this reticuloendothelial cell has these small little structures um, that are a phagocytic cell. So they can uh, engulf any type of pathogen or antigen that's located in this mixing, uh, or they can also break down components of any aged uh, erythrocyte, since we have arterial blood flow and venous blood flow coming in. But the most important aspects are going to be the cells that are lining the the outside of the sinusoid. So these are, each one of these sinusoids are uh, bordered with a hepatocyte. These hepatocytes, another name is just a basic liver cell. Um, it is, it can store vitamins and minerals. Uh, it can store tox, uh, the toxins that are pulled out from the blood also. Um, and it can also, uh, produce bile to help break down any residual fat that's coming in. So when we see the bile ductile, this is also going to be mixing inside of the sinusoid. Uh, so the hepatocytes are basically the functional unit. When you put all the sinusoids and hepatocytes together, it forms this hexagon ring, uh, which is called a hepatic lobule. Uh, the hepatic lobule also contains the central vein. So everything is going to eventually flow into the central vein, which will then be emptied into uh, the inferior uh, vena cava. So 
this is going to be the posterior aspect uh, looking at the gallbladder. Uh, so when we're looking at the gallbladder here, uh, its job is to store bile, which is important for the breakdown of fat. Uh, the bile will be released um, based off of the information coming from the small intestine. So bile will be released. Um, it goes through a common hepatic and cystic duct, and it's going to come down uh, to this hepatopancreatic ampule. So this structure right here is important because what we're going to see is the main pan pancreatic duct and the bile duct are going to converge at this hepatopancreatic ampule. Uh, there's an opening, it's called the major uh, duodenal papilla. This is where the bile is released into. Uh, but the bile will then be released into um, the region of the upper portions of the duodenum. When we look at the um, pancreas, it's considered to be a mixed gland. Uh, a mixed gland means it's going to have both an endocrine function and an exocrine function. Uh, the first part that we're going to look at is going to be this pancreatic islet here. And this pancreatic islet is going to contain an alpha cell. And the alpha cell is going to produce uh, glucagon. And then it's also going to contain a beta cell, which is going to produce insulin. Uh, so anything in the pancreatic islet uh, from the alpha cell, such as glucagon, or from the beta cell, which is insulin, eventually is going to be released into the main pancreatic duct, and then it's going to empty in uh, through the hepatopancreatic ampule. Uh, so that's considered to be an endocrine uh, type of a mixed gland. The exocrine is going to be um, the secretion of digestive enzymes and bicarbonate, and those are going to occur in the pancreatic duct. So there are cells that are lining this pan main pancreatic duct that are going to secrete a bicarbonate, which is alkaline, which helps neutralize uh, any residual acidic um, chyme that's entered into the duodenum or duodenum. So anything that's coming through that may be still acidic, uh, this main pancreatic duct has cells that can release a bicarbonate uh, to help make the chyme less acidic and more alkaline. The other part that we have is going to be uh, an endocrine function also, and this is going to be the acenar cells. They also secrete mucins and digestive enzymes, and their job is, their role is important uh, to also release into the main pancreatic duct uh, to eventually empty into uh, the duodenum. So that concludes the short lecture on the digestive histology.